Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pull of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we are going to be talking about a big Bears victory that they snatched from the jaws of defeat. Uh, we're going to be talking about the slipping and sliding Chicago Cubs and the big bopper bats of the Chicago White Sox. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly affordable prices. Sure, the season isn't going on right now, but that shouldn't stop you from heading on over to Ice Hogs. Get yourself a hat, shirt, jersey, tickets, season tickets for next year, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex, I know you are far younger than I, and I'm just going to tell you that my old heart can't take Bears games like this. Two in a row, two games in a row where it was just down to the wire, heart racing. It was more understandable last week, but there was zero reason for it to be this way this week. Absolutely none. And, you know, I'm I'm glad we came out with a win. The record is all that matters in the standings, but, man, there was just so much that happened in the second half that just it, it makes you frustrated. I mean, things started off really well, mm -hmm. and early on we were like, all right, Mitch is carrying on from from fourth quarter of last week. The defense is uh, shutting down the Giants. All right, we should be able to cruise in this game. And they got up 17 to nothing at halftime. We're like, I think everybody was like, all right, you know, now we can just put our feet up and relax for the second half of this game. And, uh, you know, early on, the, the Giants score a field goal. And you're like, okay, we're still up two touchdowns. But I started tweeting out. I'm like, listen, man, the, the, Bears, the Bears need to put a drive together and get a score, a score together. You don't want to give the Giants hope. Mm -hmm. Because if you start, if you start giving them hope, uh, then, you know, you've got a game on your hands. And that's exactly what happened is the Bears just couldn't put an offense together and they, they allowed the Giants to come back. What was really frustrating was there were a few drives in the second half where it looked like the Bears were starting to put something together. But much like the first few quarters of the season opener in Detroit, they do a good job of driving to midfield, and then things would just kind of stall. And really, things started to turn after that first deflected interception. And, you know, it just, to me, it seemed like almost like a John Fox game where they were playing not to lose, and they were playing much more conservative. It's like Matt Nagy saw that deflected interception and thought, oh boy, who do we want Mitch throwing now? Let's do a bunch of run plays and let's do a bunch of uh, quote unquote safe plays. But, you know, it's just that's exactly why you can't take your foot off the gas pedal. This game should have been over at halftime. The Giants lost Saquon Barkley and unfortunately looks like it's going to be season ending, which sucks. But you lost him. Uh, Sterling Shepard, their number one receiver, he was hobbling too. So, you know, Jones's top two weapons were out of the game, and their offensive line has not been very good. And they, they just completely took their foot off the gas pedal, really, on both sides of the ball, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, 
do you want to start on defense or, or the offense? You know what? Let's start on defense because I just have really weird feelings about it. So let's start with that. Uh, I mean, there's good and bad. Is So stats on paper. They only allowed 295 yards of offense. They had four sacks. One should have been two interceptions. A forced fumble. Five tackles for loss. Five passes defended. Only allowed the Giants to be 3-13 and 13 on third down. And held running backs to under 50 yards. Yeah, that, on paper, it looks great. That on paper looked fantastic. And, uh, but in reality is they, they stuffed them for a long time. And then there were points where they were just allowing the giants to march right down the field. Uh, these crossing patterns with t the tight end, just, uh, you know, the, you know, the bears were getting pressure, but the, uh, you know, the, the giants were, we're doing some short passes to, to kind of negate that. Um, and it just, it just looked like the bears were a step behind. Yeah. And you know, I mean, again, you look at the numbers overall, they look good. It's just, and I mean, you could put this on the offense too, for not stepping up a little bit, but you know, you look at the second half of the game, uh, you need, you, you need to put, I think, more... I mean, I don't want to say they didn't have pressure today, but it felt like they didn't have pressure when they really needed to. They had some good pressure early on, and, you know, towards the end of the game, they were trying to lock down a bit, and luckily they were able to keep them out of the end zone at the end. But, you know, there was that stretch where they were just marching down the field, and you had that touchdown drive for 75 yards, a little over four and a half minutes, and you had them pinned deep very deep and they just picked their way across and I just feel like the last two years every single game there's that one drive the opposition has where they just dink and dunk you to death and they go across the field and they eat up so much clock sometimes it's in the first quarter sometimes it's in the fourth quarter but you know I, I don't want to complain too much about the defense but I just it it seems to get really soft at times. And that's what we saw in the second half. You know, it's, it's funny. You're, you're right about the pass rush. It, it just seemed, I mean, they were collapsing that pocket like crazy. It just late in the game. It, they never, they never got home with it. Um, I mean, that pocket collapsed, but it was Daniel Jones always was able to get the pass off. And, um, and, and, you know, that's, that's on the secondary and they're, they're giving up, you know, and it, it, it's, it's on the outside. I felt like they had them on lockdown. You know, you saw Kyle Fuller with multiple pass breakups. Uh, Jalon Johnson had some nice breakups, mm -hmm. um, but it, it was those crossing patterns. Uh, and you saw, and you saw a lot of times, um, you know, to Dion Lewis underneath and, and honestly, Danny Trevathan looks old. Yeah. Yeah. Boy. Both games not not been good. And you know, I, I'm I'm just hoping that it's a sign of they didn't have a real camp, traditional camp and preseason. I'm hoping that's what it is, but yeah, it's it's not looking good with him right now. Um Let's see. What else do I have on, uh, you know, the, I mean, some real good is on that first drop back by the giants. Uh, Robert Quinn was able to get home and, and strip sack the Daniel Jones. That was huge. That was great. That was great. And that was, that was the type of play when I saw that they were up seven, nothing already. And then they made that play. Quinn strips it, Mac recovers it. It just, it felt like at that point, I'm like, hey, this is going to be one of their good days, man. Like like you said, sit back and relax. And obviously that didn't happen, but that, that felt really big. Cause that was, um, that was one of his first plays as a bear right there. So that was his, um, his one tackle is one sack. And, and right after that, I think it was the next drive you had 
Kyle Fuller do back to back pass breakups. And you're like, all right, I like this. You know, the strip sack, the the pass breakup back to back. Um, and then, you know, you don't root for this, but then the Saquon Barkley injury, and you're like, okay, this I mean, I feel really bad for him and, and I don't want to root for anybody to get injured, but you're like, okay, well, this does benefit my team. Mm-hmm. And you're like, they're probably going to go one dimensional because Dion Lewis is, is not, you're not going to, he's not going to scare you running the ball. So, uh, you're like, this team is going to get real one dimensional, pin your ears back and, and go for it. And honestly, I feel like the bears pass rush wasn't as good when they knew the passes were coming. It was like, they were better when they had to defend the run and the pass. Yeah, exactly. Uh, off and, most on defense at this game. What was that? The moment that pissed me off most on defense this game was when they pounded in the touchdown on fourth down. They ran it up the gut. It looked like they were going to swallow it up, and yet he was able to push forward and get in. Yeah, that was tough. And I thought they were... I thought they were going to run that same play, but on third down and they ended up trying to pass. And Mm -hmm. I honestly, I think, I think they caught the bears a little flat footed because I don't think the bears were expecting a run either because you're like, all right, it's fourth down and we got like two and a half yard or they have two and a half yards to go. That's a long way to run with Dion Lewis. Um, I imagine they probably thought it was going to be the same play and and lo and behold, they run it because you watched and the Bears were not ready for a run. Everybody was flat footed and got pushed backwards. Yeah. Yeah, that that was irritating. Because if you, know, you could have stopped him there, you're you're pinned at your one. But if you could have stopped him there and you could have created a little separation, you could probably have ended the game right there. You you probably could have. Um, that really what, probably would have taken the wind out of the Giants sails. And they're not a good team. That offensive line is better than they were last week. And yes. I, I think, I mean, you look at the actual individual guys and like Will Hernandez is great. I remember watching him coming out of the draft and I went, holy cow, this guy is a road grader. I, I like him. Uh, you've got your first, first round pick playing tackle. Um, you know, there's, There's, you know, there's talent there, but it's, it's the guy that was supposed to be your left tackle opted out of the season, which, you know, it gave him mad about, but it, it threw a monkey wrench in things and you just had to shift around. So the guy that you were expecting to play right tackle had to switch to left tackle. The guy that's supposed to be your swing tackle has to come in and play right tackle. And anytime you start playing musical chairs with the offensive line, There's the offensive line operates best as a single unit. And if, and if you see the best offensive lines are ones that have been together, there's some cohesion there and they, they play well together like that. If you start switching around the order and that was part of the bears problem last year is, uh, you ended up switching two people's different positions and it just didn't work out well. Yeah, and you know what was really frustrating too was when the Bears were rolling and everything was looking good. Uh the Giants were clearly frustrated and they were cl- I mean they looked like they were dead. It looked like they didn't have a chance to get back in the game. You know, it, early on they they didn't have anything going. Uh you know, the Bears defense was all over them. And they just kind of looked defeated. I mean, you remember the half ended with a missed field goal. Granted, it was a very long field goal, but still, you figure, well, you try to get some points on the board and you couldn't, and you're down by more than two touchdowns. You know, you could have, you could have crushed any microscopic bit of hope they had early on in the third quarter, because you took the ball um, over after you stopped them initially. Because remember, the Giants got the ball to start the second half. And if you could have, instead of throwing an interception, if you could have driven down and at least gotten another field goal, I think right there, then the game is a route and the Giants don't even make it close. Yeah. Um, and and you were very close 
to doing that again when Eddie Jackson intercepted that ball and ran it back for a touchdown. And you're like, oh, that was frustrating. And it gets called back. And and I I get he made contact, but there's the the def- defensive player has equal opportunity, every right to go for the ball as well. And yes. and both guys went for the ball and you know, he they touched, but you know, I, that that should have been that should have been part of the well, they were both going for the ball. And I that's that's a rough one. And what made it worse is is that they let the whole play happen. So then you've got you know the Bears the Bears team running 60 yards down the field in and they're winded and they got to come back and play defense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean and you know Jackson's eyes were on the ball so he was just watching to play the ball. You know, it's it's that 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 kind of rule should be like a jump ball. Whoever gets to the ball gets it. Yeah, it's one thing if if you hit the guy and you're not going for it. Right. Uh, if you get there early, if he would have got there early and just to make the hit and the receiver doesn't catch it, I get that's 100% flag, flag. Mm-hmm. But if that ball is up for grabs and the defensive player is going for it as well, that should that should not be a pass interference. I agree. A, a complete garbage. And, and what makes that one even more angering is uh, on the play – that Bobby Massey ended up catching the ball and falling for a first down is they, they like abused Jimmy Graham with two guys and they didn't call anything on that. So it was like, you call this on a huge play, which was a huge turning point. That would have been a huge turning point in this game and just sealed the victory for the bears. And instead, then you don't call it, a couple minutes later on Jimmy Graham. Like that's, that's frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny that that play by Bobby Massey, which honestly was pretty fortuitous for the bears. You got to admit um, that play by Bobby Massey, that play right there could have been the difference between victory and defeat. It really yeah. could have been. That was a really heads up play. And everybody should make that play. So it's, it wasn't a hard play. Like the ball's right there. You catch it. You just fall down. You don't give it an opportunity. You you know you know where the first down marker is. And if you're the offensive lineman, you just fall forward. You know? Right. And it's not a it's not a tough play. It's just you have to do it and be heads up and, and ready for it. And Bobby Massey was he was he was heads up and ready for that. And the uh. The ball gets tipped up and gets it and boom. Yeah, I he was he was a savior, I think, because yeah, the Bears didn't score on that drive, but at least it ate up some more clock. And I mean, like the Giants just ran out of time. So that ended up being really, really big. And the funny thing was, is when the play happened, I didn't even really see it. I thought it was incomplete. So I was already in uh, let out swears mode. And then all of a sudden I see the replay, a big Bobby Massey coming down and just cradling the ball in. Yeah, it was, it was very fortuitous. It was, you know, heads up play. And those are the types of plays that, that separate a winning team from a losing team. And the Bears don't look good, but they're right now they're 2 and 0 and and it's plays like that that you have to make that are all the difference. Yeah. It's the little things can just come up huge. Uh so let let's talk offense here. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Uh, so right off the bat, um, you had Mitch, Mitch throw a high pass to Allen Robinson on third and five and he's throwing off his back foot and you're like, Oh man, is this going to be another one of those games? And Allen Robinson goes up, gets it, brings it down first down bears. And suddenly you're like, okay, all right. You know, we got away with that one. And you marched on the field. Um, 
and you're like, okay, offense seems to be be moving along. The they're running the ball effectively. Um, you know, Mitch Mitch is finding receivers. I I like this. You're taking advantage of a Giants defense that that has pretty much limited pass rush and and for the most part bad defensive backs. Well, I mean, it's it is something you have to take advantage of. Um you had the that beautiful throw by Mitch Trubisky that that Anthony Miller drops. That was frustrating because it, it was one of those things where you saw the play happen in real time. You're thinking, oh, Trubisky with another bad throw and weird decision. Then you look at the replay, you're like, oh my God, that was a perfect pass. Miller should have just caught that. Yeah, it was it was a beautiful pass. Um but uh you know honestly we saw the gamut of of what Mitch Trubisky is in this game. You saw him throw some just beautiful passes. But you saw him miss some passes and make some bad decisions and throwing into tight coverage when there was wide open guys. You saw him just not see a read of a wide open wide receiver that would have been a touchdown, like a seventy yard touchdown pass. Um, and you saw the 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 poor pocket awareness and you know him as a scrambler, very good. But him as a as a an actual premeditated runner, not that good. No, not great. Uh, so I mean, those in the first half, you had a, a couple of, of called plays with Mitch Trubisky running, and they were just they were <laughs> bad. No, I mean, really, I like Trubisky running only when he needs to because. You know, you look late in the game. He had that really nice run to get a first down um, on one of those last drives. But early on, when you were actually calling the right, it just it, it wasn't working out. So don't do that. Um. Yeah, it's 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 tough. I'm watching the uh, the Seahawks New England game, and Russell Wilson just threw a pick six. Ooh. Um. And, and and Trubisky's pocket awareness is just bad. It, it's bad. A lot of those sacks were ones that, if he had better pocket awareness, he could have stepped up in the pocket. Um, instead, he he won't ever go forward in the pocket. No, that, it, it's always he goes side to side, and a lot of times that's that's where the pocket is collapsing is a is around from the side is, and he'll go backwards and then go around. He never steps up in the pocket, and you watch that's that has been the bread and butter of a Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers. You step up in the pocket, and you buy yourself another two seconds to throw the ball, and you hit those plays. And honestly, you should be throwing better when you step up in the pocket because you're not throwing off your back foot. You're moving forward, and you're throwing you're throwing with all the momentum going forward. It, it should be a better throw. And Mitch does not do that. He doesn't. He doesn't sense that pressure and step up. And that's why there was not a ton of pressure on him. But I think I want to say he was sacked three times. He was sacked a couple of times. Um, he was sacked. Da, 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 stats. I want to sack four times. Four times. Yeah. And, and and I don't think any of them were like, oh man, they had him dead to rights. Uh, it was, it was his poor pocket presence and that that's frustrating. It is, it is, um, the, the first interception by Mitch, you're like, okay, we, you sort of can take, you know, I've saw some people like you could take some of the blame off of him because it was tipped up and, and intercepted. But the fact was, is he threw into into a, a crowded area and and when that happens is you know balls get batted you, you gotta you gotta be better about that 
Um, they, the guy is athletic. Move the pocket. Take off running. Throw the ball away. Don't don't try to don't try to beat the coverage with a, a low throw like that because you're gonna you're gonna get burned. And he I, did. I was more upset with the first interception just because I didn't think that was a smart throw because he was covered so well. You look at the second interception and you say, well, I don't like the play call. I don't like a jump ball on third down when you're trying to convert and move the chains. But A, that was an incredible move by the defender to basically take that ball away. And two, you could argue that Robinson should have came down with that one. But that first one, he was very tightly covered. He didn't really have much of a window at all. And there were others that he could have made other plays. That was that to me was an ill-advised throw. The, yeah, the first one, I it, it was an ill-advised throw. And the second one, it, it was a bad throw and an ill-advised throw. The second one, I don't think it was a terrible throw. Like, should have been a little higher. And because then the defender has no chance to come up with it, but it was a, it was an amazing play by the defensive back. Uh, but I was annoyed with the decision on that one because it's like what third and four, third and five, and you're going deep. You're trying to protect the lead is all you need to do is move the sticks. It's not, it's not a case where time's running out and you have to march down the field for a touchdown or a field goal. You are just trying to run the clock out and keep possession of the ball, move the sticks, and uh, and you're trying to pick up a big chunk of yards. And I just, I, I just was frustrated by that decision much more than the throw on that second one. I completely agree. That's exactly how I felt. Exactly how I felt. Um, Darnell Mooney, like, looked good. Uh, a lot of good things from him, and you know, Ted Ted Ginn Jr. was a, a healthy scratch today, and because he got he got beat out by Mooney in mm -hmm. on the, on, the roster spot, and and that is that makes me happy. Yeah, I mean, uh, two really big catches today, and I mean, both Trubisky and Darnell Mooney did a good job getting that touchdown. It proved to be the game winner um, at the end of the first half, but. Yeah, I mean, you got to give a lot of props to him. And he was um, not the receiving yards leader, but the receiving yards leader among wide receivers. Uh, so a good job for him. I mean, really. Targeted three times, made three catches, had the one touchdown. Um, I was very happy to see that as well. I really, really enjoyed watching that touchdown catch that he made because Trubisky did a good job of keeping it alive. You know, he scrambled, he scrambled, then he threw a cross and found Darnell Mooney, who was able to just reach up and get it. And, you know, that that proved to be a really big play in the game. So props to him, man. And then that was a play breakdown. So you what you had is is that wasn't the way it was drawn up. Right. It was Trubisky bought a bunch of time and uh and Mooney. Mooney made other moves and got himself open and and you have to respect that speed of his because he's he's probably he's probably the fastest guy on the field at at that moment. Um so when you're going deep like that, it's it's you've got to you've got to respect that speed and and he worked his way open and I I was super happy for him, you know, that was a big play. It wasn't the best of throws and it's funny when when I saw it happen live, I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing, awesome. And then I saw the replay and I was like, ooh, that was a wobbler throw, not a good throw. Yes, it was. But, but then when you watched, I watched it from another angle and it was a perfectly fine spiral. It hit a wind patch and then wobbled because he had some air under it. And I was like, all right, that's a Soldier Field wind one. Um, I'm not going to be mad at that. Is it, you know, I went from happy to annoyed to to happy to to you know fine, and uh, and it, that was a win patch one. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ding Trubisky on that. 
No, I won't either. Um, you know, I was thinking the same thing because you kind of, like you said, you saw it go up and then suddenly wobble, 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 wobble. But hey, it got there, got the touchdown. It was a great play. It's probably the Bears' best play of the game. Um, you know what's really, really frustrating though? It, watch that first drive of the game from the Bears. That was a great drive. 12 plays, 77 yards. They converted on third down multiple times. Trubisky ended it by dumping it off, uh, you know, a pass towards the side to David Montgomery. And he was able to run in for the touchdown, getting around some guys and getting some blocks. I mean, that was so well executed. What's frustrating is that the Bears only put that type of drive together like once a game. I mean, you had the drive to score the touchdown late, obviously, but, you know, that was arguably more impressive, but you just, you want to see that more consistently, not just one or two quarters. If they could do that three, four times, then you're looking at something completely different. Now you're seeing it maybe once or twice. You had two really good drives today, and then punts and interceptions. So I just, you see the small bits of things working, but you only get them in small bits. Because both touchdown plays you know, were very nice plays, both by David Montgomery and by Darnell Mooney. Yeah, the David Montgomery one was fantastic. David Montgomery had a great game. Um, that that touchdown catch was that was a beautiful play because that was a breakdown of a play. Trubisky rolled out and he drew the defender in, and then bought some more time, dumped it off, and what should have been you know a nice gain. David Montgomery faked a guy out of his shorts that he was going outside brought it back inside and and brought it in for a, a touchdown. And oh my goodness, Bill Belichick's son is the outside linebackers coach and he has a total mullet. Oh boy. Like a like a 80s mullet. That's like, great. Like a like a Joe Dirt. <laughs> wow. Um but that that play by David Montgomery was great and you saw a lot of great plays by David Montgomery and we totally lucked out that he was not seriously injured in that game. No, because he was probably my player of the game. If I had to choose a player of the game for the Bears, David Montgomery is the one I'd be tempted to give to. You look at what he did on the ground, 16 carries, 82 yards. You look at what he did receiving, 3 yards or uh, 3 catches, 45 yards. And that touchdown we talked about, three for three, targeting, receiving. So 127 scrimmage yards total and a touchdown. And you looked at that last Bears drive. And again, even though they didn't score, you saw him pounding away and getting 10 plus yard gains. I mean, that really was a difference maker too. You know, I talked about the Bobby Massey catch, but, you know, they were set up in their, um, in enemy territory starting in their own territory, going to that point because of David Montgomery's running. So, you know, props to him for having a very good game because that injury looked pretty scary when it first happened. And the fact that he was able to come in and rack up some yards and continue to contribute, you got to give him a lot of credit. And, you know, he made some nice plays too, just on short plays to get first downs. And that's what was so nice about that early drive was when, they were able to just keep things simple, not try to make too much on a third down play. Just just move the chains. Just keep the chains moving. Don't try to throw a jump ball. Don't try to do anything fancy. Just keep it simple and move right along. And Dave Montgomery was a big part of that. Yeah, and, and I loved a lot of the Bears game plan I liked. Um, <laughs> excuse me. You had Midge Trubisky had 28... 28 pass attempts and you had the running backs with 28 carries. Um, and you add in those, those, uh, I think three, uh, intentional, uh, pre-designed quarterback runs. And you ended up with more run plays than you did pass plays. Yeah. And that's and, not something you're used to seeing with Matt Nagy. No. So Matt Nagy is, is learning and evolving 
And I, that part I appreciate. Um, but what I, what I just didn't understand is some of the play calling gets very conservative and, you know, I just feel like you, you need to, you need to put away an NFL team. If you've got the lead, don't, don't let them come back. We saw the, we saw the bears come back because the, the lions couldn't put the dagger in the bears Mm -hmm. and they, they had their, their foot on the bears throat last week and they took it off and the bears came back to win. And you almost had the, the giants come back and win. Um, and, and those are two teams that were depleted by injuries. So right. what's going to happen when you're you're playing a a team that that's not depleted by injuries that's much mm, much more talented than these two? Yeah. 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 There was a bit in the third quarter where it felt like, I think I said this earlier but it felt kind of like a John Fox game. Yeah, it's 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 frustrating. Uh you know, you've got You've got these two good tight ends that you're not utilizing. the the whole The whole Matt Nagy offense is supposed to be, you know, designed to 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 be big time use of of tight ends as a weapon, and you really didn't see that this game. Uh, you had Jimmy Graham was targeted once. Um, I think it was actually twice because it was the one at the end that got tipped by. He was targeted Massey. once, um, and he had the eighteen-yard play, and that was. And it. Cole Komet was was targeted once. Yep. Yep. Only uh, three guys were targeted more than two times: David Montgomery, Darnell Mooney, and Allen Robinson. Everybody else was targeted two times or less. No, Miller was targeted three times. He just had no catches. Oh yeah, sorry, I misread that. Yeah, he's he's down at the bottom here because zero catches, zero yards, zero touchdown. Yeah, forgive me, that's three people. Um, Anthony Anthony Miller, and I'm glad you brought him up. Had a terrible game. Yeah, yeah, he, two big drops, two big drops, just silent, absolute silent. And and honestly, Allen Robinson didn't have that great of a game either. No, um, he did not. And I'm just gonna say this. It's not because of conspiracy. It, it, it's not. Anyway, no, 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 no conspiracy. And we'll get to the contract situation and and all of the nonsense from this week. Um, and and yeah, we'll get to that. But Allen Robinson didn't have a great game, and uh, Anthony Miller had a terrible game. Probably his worst as a bear. Um, and and so. That was frustrating is because I actually saw several people, like actual legit media people that are NFL writers and, and broadcasters, say that they expected Anthony Miller to be the X Factor in this game. And he was dreadful. And you know what? Two catches could have made a huge difference. Oh, that, that it would it could have been huge. Heck, just the one catching a touchdown pass early that should have been. Because then you go up by 14, most likely. Yeah, so, I, I mean, you need to you need to design some more plays to get these tight ends in the, in the groove. Because those are where you create mismatches. Um, and it's going to open more things up. Sure, I like, I like the fact that David Montgomery had three catches for 45 yards. But, uh, you know, it, uh, Robinson should have, should be having, you know, somewhere 75 yards plus Jimmy Graham should be targeted more than once. Cole Komet should be targeted more than once. Um, you know, we bitched about the fact that our tight ends production was so bad last year, but you know what? We've got two good tight ends now and we're not utilizing them. And, and that comes to Matt Nagy is draw the plays up. And and honestly, we need to see better of Mitch. Yeah, honestly. well, I don't know how much more you're going to get at this point. I mean, I'm just looking at the tight end numbers right now. What, three total targets to a tight end? One to Graham, one to Komet, one to Demetrius Harris? Like, that's that's it. That That's it. And he, had, he threw 28 times. And, 
Um, you know, the Bears, the Bears should be having more more yards on than you know on offense than they do. Uh, you know, as a as a team, you know they they're not getting it done. Um, the Bears had 304 yards of total offense, and, and that's and 17 points. That's just not going to get it done. You no. need to be moving the ball more. You had 169 yard pass yards passing, not going to get the job done. Again, in the first half, it was on pace to be pretty good. If yeah. things would have continued the way it did in the first half, I mean, like I said, they were keeping it more simple, and that was good. Uh, but you know, obviously, you had the big drop by Miller, and then um, you know, but either way, you still put 17 points in the first half. 17 points in the first half, thumbs up. Uh, that's good. I want to see that. Holding the opponent to zero points in the first half, thumbs up. Good. I want to see that. But it's it's not a one half game. It's it's a full four four quarters, two halves. Like you need to be playing four quarters and two halves. And there there is four minutes and 40 seconds left in the first quarter of this game. And the Patriots just took their first snap on offense. Oh, wow. And it's 7-7. Wow. <laughs> um, it, so, so, honestly, it's... You need... You need you need to call better plays. You need Mitch to be better. Um, you know, he needs, you need to get your tight ends more involved. And I appreciate, I really do appreciate the fact that they got the running game going. Me too. And that's the, and the fact that the running game is so already so much better than it was last year. Uh, but if, if the, you can't, if you can't distribute it to your tight ends, uh, you're you're just not going to win big games, and you know that's that's just a f- a fact of life in this league in in 2020. Yep, exactly. I think the run game was far and away my biggest uh, biggest thumbs up of the game. My biggest uh, star of the game, if you will. My number one star. I got to give it to the running game and. I know Cordero Patterson uh, didn't get that many yards rushing. It's not like he did great rushing, but he got seven carries, which which is interesting. And Tariq Cohen only got five. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I mean, Cohen just got an extension, but not a lot of carries. You you need, again, I, I, I say it all the time, is I don't think you should be giving him a ton of carries as a running back. Right. You should be using him in in the past game. Um, you should be using him for for misdirections, uh, and and you know he needs snaps, but he may not doesn't necessarily need carries. So you don't want to make him be a gadget back where um, as as soon as he's in there, you're yelling Cohen, 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 and everybody pays attention to him. You need you need him in there enough where. When it's when it's time when you throw a do a gadget play, you do a screen pass. It it's you're not uh, you know projecting what you're doing by having him in the formation, right? And but he does need more touches, and whether that be as a slot receiver, as going out for screen passes, um, you know, jet sweeps, um. He needs he needs to touch the ball more, and I don't necessarily think it should be running up the middle. Yeah, I don't either. I think he's he's just not a power back, despite him wanting to be one. He's just not a power back, and we really Wait, didn't see him. Not only wanting to be one, announcing to everybody this week that he is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but look at you look at you know going back to the tight end production is Kansas City had a tough game today. Uh, you saw Pat Mahomes look, look, uh, oh, you know, beatable. Um, but Travis Kelsey, 14 targets, 14 targets, nine catches, 90 yards and a touchdown. Like, you know, I think that's a bit excessive, but you need to see more, uh, you know, more production from that, that tight end spot. 
You look at you look at the Rams. Uh, Tyler Higby, their tight end, five targets, fifty-four catches, three touchdowns. Um, you look at um, uh, you look at Reed from from San Francisco. He had eight eight targets, seven t- uh, catches, fifty yards, two two touchdowns. You know, you're you're looking around the league and things are moving through the tight ends. Zach Ertz, seven targets, five catches, 42 yards. And then you go and you look at the Bears and your the stat line is much different. Jimmy Graham, uh one target, 18 yards. Um clicked off of there is is uh sorry one target 18 yards cole Komet one target 12 yards zero touchdowns between the two you you need to get them involved you have to yeah yeah i mean look at what san francisco did last year with george kittle look how that benefited them look at travis kelsey look at zach Ertz. Mm -hmm. look at look at teams that are doing well and you'll i'll point to a team that has a tight end that's doing great Hey, remember the Seahawks when Jimmy Graham was in his prime? Remember when he was in New Orleans too? Yeah. Um, you know, you're not going to get that same guy, but still, you're you know, you, between him and Cole Komet, you should be able to get a, a much much more production in the tight end right. position. Right. Yeah, you're just going to have to use them. And again, look at uh, look at even more recently, like look at all the years of Kyle Rudolph in uh, Minnesota. It's just that's got a something that's got to happen moving forward. I mean, you you knew that tight ends were one of the biggest problems on your team, and you drafted high. You used your first pick of the draft on a tight end, and you spent a lot of money on a tight end. So you got to use them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. Is there anything else from the actual game you wanted to talk about? I just wanted to make a quick comment about the missed field goal by Cairo Santos. I know there is a lot of uh, debate over that, at least based on what I've heard from, like, you know, the internet and people talking and post-game shows or whatever. I felt like that was kind of a tough call because you don't want... I mean, you were in a a makeable field goal range for most NFL kickers. And you didn't want to necessarily punt because you don't just want to give them the ball back without trying to get more points and go up by at least a touchdown. But at the same time, you're relying on your backup practice squad esque kicker right now, who's looked good overall outside that one kick. But you know, most of his kicks have either been extra points or, you know, kicks inside the 40 yard line, uh, Mark. So yeah, I, I have very mixed feelings about that because if Santos would have hit that field goal, then you're up by a touchdown with like, what, a minute and a half to go or how much ever time there was. But, you know, I know there was kind of debate over whether they should or should not have kicked it. And I'm going to say I'll defend Nagy's choice to go for it and kick for it. While I do understand it was risky. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. It's. I mean, Soldier Field is a real tough place to kick. Yeah, uh, it was a bad kick. It was. It was actually the conditions were actually pretty decent. Um, he he just missed that kick, and so I'm not mad at Matt Na- Nagy for kicking it. I'm mad at Matt Nagy for play calling to get to that point. Um, but you know, Santos Santos should be hitting that. Uh, he practiced in Soldier Field this week. Um, you know, he got some of the conditions down. It, the conditions weren't bad. No, they uh, weren't. You know, he just he just got a bad kickoff. Yeah. And it's actually kind of funny because off the foot, it looked like it was going to be like 20, 30, 40 feet wide. It actually kind of curled back closer than I thought it was going to be. But it's still obviously missed. I'm just saying. Yeah, it was... 
it's frustrating. Even more frustrating is I don't know if you watched the end of the Chiefs Chargers game. Fifty eight yards, wasn't it? He kicked three of them. God. So he kicked a he kicked a well, no sorry kicked a fifty three, and there was a penalty. It was a false start by the offensive line, so they moved it back to fifty eight. And he kicked it even better, except they called it, the Chargers called the timeout. So then he kicked it a third time. So he kicked a 53, a 58, and 58 like they were nothing. They wasn't even they just no problem, no brainers. Like they were chip shots. Yeah. Uh, it, it was infuriating. Made it look easy. Um, I, I did want to bring up, so Tariq Cohen... After so, let's start with Allen Robinson. Mm -hmm. There was report that Allen Robinson was unhappy because he doesn't have a contract extension. Then there was the report that he scrubbed all mention of the Bears from his social media. Then you had uh, several other Bears players tweeting about how Allen Robinson should be getting paid, and then Tariq Cohen got paid. Yeah. Honestly, honestly, the Bears have incentive to to sign Allen Robinson to to a contract. But they also have the leverage because if Allen Robinson if Allen Robinson doesn't sign the long-term deal, number 1 he doesn't have that security which he wants. And number two is the Bears can franchise tag him. And what's the beauty of the franchise tag? It's probably going to be less per year than than what a lot of these wide receivers are getting in the big contracts. Hmm. That's true. I mean, not astronomically less, but it's going to be, I think I saw the, uh, the franchise tag for a wide receiver is going to be 147 and you're probably looking at like 16, 17, 18, 19 million per year if, if they re-sign him. So, I mean, financially it makes sense for the Bears, but it's it's nice to have the flexibility of having a guy signed and you can um and you can structure it to to benefit your salary cap situation. Yeah, and I have a feeling that um, you know, a lot of what Robinson did, like with the Instagram, I just think he's kind of playing hardball here. And I actually do feel like an extension will be had soon. I'm feeling pretty confident about it. Um, a lot of times I'd feel pretty pessimistic about it, but right now I'm actually feeling pretty optimistic about it. So I'm hoping we hear that announcement soon um, because, you know, you just – you have such a talented guy in Allen Robinson, and you want to know he's going to be here for the long haul because before we got Allen Robinson, we were going out and picking up guys like Dontrell Inman to be our number one guy. And before that, we had like Cameron Meredith. It's like, you know, you were struggling and dumpster diving to try to find some decent wide receivers. And now that you have a chance to have a long term wide receiver number one in Allen Robinson, who has already shown you what a special player he is, you want to get that locked down as soon as possible. Oh, fully agree. Um, and, and it makes having that number one receiver makes all of your other receivers look better. Um, and, and honestly, I think today was – he, he, you're seeing what a distracted Allen Robinson looks like because he just didn't look like Allen Robinson today, especially against uh, and not that great of a defensive backfield from from the Giants. You should have seen him eat up team uh, eat up that that defensive backfield. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I think I think you had a distracted player. Honestly, it's been yeah. a, it's been a you know a, a rough week of of him clearly being upset and then having to backtrack once he talked to the team. And, you know, there was talks before that, you know, the bears hadn't made any offer and the, the bears have for all of their flaws, they have been uh, very good about re-signing players on their team and getting those things done early. You look at Cody Whitehair, you look at 
Bobby Massey. You look at uh, Kyle Long got an extension like that, right? You, Kyle Long, uh, Charles Leno, now Tariq Cohen, is Danny Trevathan, Eddie Jackson, uh, Akeem Hicks, uh, Eddie Goldman, Khalil Mack. When they traded for him, they extended well, they, him right they, away. Is you know so they they do these things and. I, I think it's a, you know, I wish they would have done it a little sooner. I think they would have saved some money after some of these other extensions. But I, I think Robert Woods' contract is probably is probably comparable to uh, to what you're going to see um, uh, Allen Robinson get. Yeah. And I'm pulling that up, and it's... Four years, sixty-five million with thirty-two guaranteed. So, guessing around that ballpark for Robinson. Yeah, so I'm guessing. I'm guessing that's about a fair, um, you know, value. So it's like sixteen point two five a year. So it's a raise off of what he's getting. You have, um, you know, you give him a big chunk. You give him a big chunk of of that guaranteed, and um, you know he's got that security, and you know he signed for four years. Like I, I think, I think that's that's the contract you're you're looking for. Um, but I think he's probably trying to get up to that twenty mark, and it, and it's it's just not going to happen because. Uh, you know, as as much as I like Allen Robinson and I think he's a special back or a special receiver, I I don't think he's he's one of those absolute you know beast receivers that that deserves you know those those giant contracts. He's not Randy Moss. As good as he is, he's not like Randy Moss or somebody like that. I, I think anything above eighteen is kind of too much. You know. DeAndre Hopkins got paid. I think he's better than Allen Robinson. Um, Tariq Hill is 18 a year. He's better than Allen Robinson. Odell Beckham Jr., 18 a year. I think Allen Ro- I think that's, you know, Odell Beckham has made a bigger name for himself, but I don't think he's as good of a receiver. Mike Evans is 16-5. I think he's a better receiver than Allen Robinson. Brandon Cooks is 16-2. I think they're about on par. Um, Adam Thielen is 16-2. I think Allen Robinson is better. Um, so you're looking at that. That's the sort of range there it is about 16 a year. And um, and and that's, that's what Robert Woods just got. And I think that's a fair number. It gives him a little bit of a salary bump and gives him a, you know, a, a guaranteed amount and, and has him be here till his thirties. Yep. Yeah. I think you evaluated it well because obviously I think he's a top 15 receiver in football. Is he the very best? No. Does he deserve a payday? Yes. But I think between 16 and 17 is very reasonable. And I think that's what, you're going to get, I, I I mean, I think he's probably going hardball for the 1819, but it, he's not going to get it. Right. And, and, and the bears really just have all the leverage because if they can franchise him next year, and I think they, I think I read the franchise for a wide receiver is a little under 15. And so that means the bears would get him for, for less than that in a one-year deal. And then they could do it again the next year. It probably will go up from that point because of the the cap going back up after COVID. Um, but you know, you know, Allen Robinson then has to play on under under a, a franchise tag. No player likes to do that. No. And and the Bears have, you know, they're able to keep their guy. He's not going to hit the open market. So. I just hope the deal gets done sooner rather than later. I just don't want to see it drag into the offseason and be a distraction. Yeah, I want to see it be a distraction. And you're kind of tired of hearing about it, too. Once it's all done, we can just finally move on from it. Yeah, absolutely. Is pay him. He's happy. Um, 
We're know, happy. Need, Everyone's you happy. Need, you need him to be a cog in this offense, and uh, you just you, you just don't want to see him be unhappy. And wide receivers are naturally prima donnas, so uh, just, just pay him, get this over with, and, and be done with it. Ryan Pace is in his office. Okay, okay, I'll get you your extension. Would you also like some McDonald's gift cards? Uh, we've got the Halloween ones that I give out to the kids that trick or treat in my neighborhood. <laughs> he he just takes out like a giant box. Here, have all you want. He just reaches in, like grabs handfuls and just chucks them at him. It, it's it, it it's good for an apple pie or a small ice cream cone <laughs> or a McDonald's small French fry. <laughs> Limit one per one per trip. Uh, and then then uh Ryan Pace reveals a secret that uh you know he hired an enforcer to help him uh keep Alan Robinson in the room uh to sign the deal, and then Alan Robinson looks behind and he hears <laughs> it's John Lecky. Uh, <laughs> What what's this about McDonald's gift cards? <laughs> the goddamn Ricketts didn't give me no McDonald's gift cards. <laughs> I'll give you Buttercup. all the chaw you want if you help us here. Buttercup loves French fries. <laughs> or she calls them freedom fries. <laughs> because I told her to. And then you have Alan Robinson saying you know, maybe I'd like this, uh, you know, this amount. And he slides the paper over. And as soon as Pace disagrees, uh, John Lackey has to ping in his spittoon and be like, no, nah, lower. Is He slides, Alan Robinson slides the paper across the table with his number on it. Ryan Pace looks at it and just shakes his head no. And you see, you see a lasso shoot across the room, catch it and pull it back. <laughs> oh man i would love to see something like that unfold all right so next week uh we've got we'll be facing an zero and two falcons team and that zero and two number is really deceptive because they have put up some points this falcons team has put up uh, 64 points in two games. So they are, they are firing on all cylinders on offense. So the bears are going to have to score points. And the, the problem is, and is they're giving up a lot of, a lot of passing yards to quarterbacks. Yep. But not a lot of running yards. So, we're going to need Mitch to be on his A game for four quarters if we're going to beat the the Atlanta Falcons. And you also got to hope that the Falcons might be so dejected after this historical collapse today against the Cowboys. I mean, incredible that they lost that game. But then again, we're used to the Falcons blowing leads. <laughs> cough, Super Bowl, cough. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, they still have an offense. They still have a quarterback in Matt Ryan that could really put some points on the board. And, you know, like you said, uh, the quarterbacks against the Bears have been getting yards in chunks. We saw it in the second half of today's game, and we saw how many yards Matt Stafford got against the Bears last week and what their offense did. So it's going to be hard. And you're playing in Atlanta, and granted, there's no crowd, but, you know, playing in Atlanta is still a tough place to play. Uh, so the Bears are really going to have to play some good fundamental football next week. You want to get an early lead. You want to try to score as much as you can against the defense. And you got to put pressure on Matt Ryan. You really got to bring the heat to him. You can't make it easy for him because if he's not under pressure and he has time to throw, you know, his guys can create some separation and he will hit those targets. He is a good quarterback. Yeah, he's the best quarterback you've faced this year. Um, but I mean, the, the beauty, the one saving grace is sure. The, the Falcons offense has scored 64 points in two games, 
their defense has given up 78 points in two games. So you're going to have to score. The scoring 17 points, 20 points, not going to do it. Not going to no. do it. it is, no. So game one, the Falcons lost 38-25 to to Seattle. And Russell Wilson threw for 322 yards and four touchdown passes. Mm -hmm. But he was also the leading receiver and only ran for 29 yards. So they really, they were able to stop the run. Um, and Matt Ryan had, threw for 450 yards, two touchdowns and an interception. Today, and that was against Seattle. Yeah. And in today's game, they gave up 450 passing yards to Dak Prescott in one touchdown uh, and held Ezekiel Elliott to under 100 yards. But Matt Ryan threw for 273 and four touchdowns. Yeah, I mean, Mitch Trubisky is just going to have to step up. If you know, if they're going to be able to shut down the run game, you're just going to need to pass. You're you're going to, I mean, you're going to have to, you're going to have to establish a run. I, I think that's, uh, you know, this team and this quarterback aren't good enough to to just pass the ball at, like a Drew, Drew Brees or a Tom Brady or, you know, a Russell Wilson and, and pass happy and despite no running game. He's just not, Mitch Trubisky is not good enough. But you're going to have to, so you're going to have to establish some run, but Mitch Trubisky is going to have to step up. And he's going to have to, you're going to have to have a good game plan. You're going to have to utilize those tight ends like we talked about. Allen Robinson, going to have to have it be in a good headspace. You're going to need these guys to come up with big catches because you know Mitch isn't going to throw everyone right between the numbers. You're going to have to catch some of those that are off your fingertips. Yeah, and you're going to need to get the tight ends going, as we've said. Um, so, you know, it is a it is a game that they can win, but this is this is probably one of the best zero and two teams you're going to face. And the you know the funny part is, is the you know it's it's uh, strength against strength and and weakness against weakness. So Bears the Bears defense is their strength. Um, and the the Falcons' offense is their strength, and the Falcons have an Achilles' heel of no defense, and the Bears have just really struggled on offense. Um, and and you know honestly, is the Bears faced two teams that struggled on defense so far this season and haven't racked up that many points. No, know? um, so it, it's you know they they had better they had better figure this out this week because it, it you're not going to you're not going to score you're not going to score 17 points and win this game um maybe maybe if you do like the 27 you put up on the lions maybe the 27 might win but it's you're going to have to you're going to have to really have your offense firing on all cylinders if you're going to win that game yeah, I mean it's it's gonna be a very tough win if they keep playing the way they are. But if they can step up, then we'll see. I feel like the Bears' defense can at least hold them to less of what they've scored in the last two games. But they're still gonna put up some points. I think they could still at least put up twenty points. So if the Bears can, I, I don't really, I'm not very confident in this, but. If they could get to the 30 point marker and the Bears defense can just hold its own, then you can win that game. Uh, I mean, I think I think the Bears have to score 27 to win this game. At least. At least. I I think the Bears can hold, I mean, the Falcons held them to 25. But uh, I think I think if you can establish a running game, which nobody really has done, if you can establish a running game against them and you know, keep their offense off the field and ball control and then have Mitch make those passes when he needs to make those passes. Uh, you've got a shot. 
you've got a shot. It's not they're not a they're not an unbeatable team. It's just the the way you beat the Falcons is is not a strength that the Bears have. Right. Um I I still hold strong to my to my preseason prediction. I think that's their first loss of the season. I could see it. I I go very back. I was going very back and forth during my preseason predictions, whether win or loss, because I right now I could definitely see a loss. Just combining with the Falcons on what they're capable of and being at home versus also what the Falcons are able of choking on and the Bears defense. So, you know, we look at the matchups and how there's a lot of opposites. Basically, something's got to give. Yeah, strength against strength, weakness against weakness. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, should we switch gears to baseball here? Sure. Um, where do you want to start? Well, um, you know, I just think out of fairness, since the White Sox clinched their first playoff appearance since 2008, we can start with them. Uh, so the White Sox... The White Sox seemingly have have things going in their way. Sure, they they didn't have a, a good game today, but the the White Sox the White Sox really have things, you know, going well. Um, and they brought up Garrett Crochet with no minor league experience, and sure, he only picked pitched one inning. Holy cow, did he look good? Yeah, the stuff was 100 plus miles an hour. Pretty uh pretty fun watching a pitcher do that. Yeah, I, I mean, it it was it was something of of beauty. Um and you know, I don't know I don't know if he can keep that up or or what, but the guy has good stuff and he he brings the heat. And I wonder if they're going to eventually move him into a starting role, or if if their their vision is is him to be a reliever. But either way, the the, the guy had some some great stuff, and and it was kind of shocking the that you know I don't think anybody was expecting him to be brought up and and to pitch right away. No, I wasn't. And the fact that he got some work in, it was nice that he came in in a low leverage situation. You know, the team was down, and you were just gonna pitch one inning. So I think that's the way to kind of ease him to it. And the White Sox have done a pretty good job with that. Like it kind of like Chris Sale. Remember when they brought him up, he started as a reliever and then he eased his way into the starting spot. And we all know how good Chris Sale ended up being. So I think it's the right approach. Um, and, and yesterday you had Dallas Keiko come back from, from the injured list and sure. He didn't pitch a, a lot of innings. He only pitched the four innings, but, um, you know, four hits, no runs, uh, solid start. And, and the White Sox, you know, got that win over Cincinnati, who have been pretty good as of late. They've been playing much better. I mean, they're creeping their way back into this thing. They're not done. No, no, they're not. I mean, they're probably going to make the playoffs. Um, and the way that team is built, I, I mean, I know it's not the... You know, we're not talking about one of the Chicago teams, but the way the Reds are built, they've got the bats and they've got the arms. If they can put those together, they could make noise in the playoffs. It's kind of scary because they feel like they could be that team that was down and out through like 80% of the season. And then they just were able to squeak in last minute and all of a sudden they're making long runs and, you know, watch out for them. Watch out for them. Um. But yeah, I mean the White Sox, the White Sox clinched the playoff, and it's the first one in a long time. Um, and and you go into the playoffs being like, you know, I think this team can really make noise. You look at the that their, you know, the betting line for them to win the the World Series, and though that number has has really really moved down, um, you know, now they're. They're a team that, you know, betting wise is is one of the the more favored teams. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Things are rolling pretty good for them right now. I mean, the offense is great. 
The bullpen looks good too. I mean, you know, just so much mashing on the side of the offense and, you know, good for them. It's, it's just too bad. They couldn't clinch in front of the fans. It's, it's kind of funny. You, you clinch your first postseason in 12 years, and it's during a pandemic where there's nobody in the stands. So very weird times, but you know it's still probably very fun for the uh, the White Sox fans to be able to at least enjoy it. And you know, it, you know, I've said this on many shows. I'll say it again. There's really no pressure on them right now, so just ride it as long as you can. Yeah, and you know they've they've um, you know got their playoff bid. Uh, you know, the Cubs could really help them by beating, beating the twins, but that's proven to be a struggle, man. Not looking good right now. <laughs> uh, but I mean, man, this White Sox team is, is just really good. And it's, it's funny that that series against the White Sox had against the twins earlier in the week, the White Sox won that series. And, you know, I've heard a lot of people describe it, how, it was like a playoff atmosphere in the regular season between these two because they are two of the better teams in the AL. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the twins, uh, the twins were the favorite going in. They, they won the division last year and, and the white Sox are, you know, they're, it, it's not like the twins are faltering. The white Sox are stepping up and, and taking that crown and, you know, so it's, it's a tough, it's a, you know, it's a tough fight here between the two teams going down the stretch here. Yeah. You know, I, the AL central has been pretty fun too, because while the Indians had quite a bit of skid, you know, they, they're looking to make the postseason too. So, you know, you're, you're currently looking at three very competitive teams in the AL central right now. And, you know, the White Sox, I think they made a pretty big statement by taking three or four against the twins. And, you know, they were, there were some tough battles, you know. Th th some of those games were close. They were tough battles, and that's that's what you kind of expect in a in a playoff like game. And you know that the that description fits those games pretty well. So, yeah, I mean, you got to appreciate the fact that they're able to step up as a young team and come up with some big wins. Yeah, and and you you look at the the AL Central, and we thought that it was going to be a, a a bad division, and it, it's it's actually not. Um, you know, the, the Indians, the Indians are in third place and they've got a 540, they're five games above 500 and a 547 win percentage. Um, you know, they, like, that's a, that's a pretty good record here. And, uh, you know, the White Sox, the White Sox have the second best record in the AL. Um, and they're, they're knocking at the raised door here. Um, it's 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 been a dogfight here in, in this division, and even the, the Tigers for a while were were holding strong. It's been mm -hmm. it's been the Royals are the only ones that you know aren't are holding up there into the bargain here. Well, we all know they were going to be dust poop this year. <laughs> um, you know, so you know we're coming down the stretch here because the the White Sox don't have a ton of games left here. Um, you know. They've only got a few series left and, and they are just, they're just really pounding, pounding the baseball. Um, you know, they have two series left after. Yeah. This? I don't, yeah. I mean, there's the, I don't know who they're playing after the reds. And then the last one is Cubs white Sox at uh guaranteed rate. Yeah. I know that one, but I think there's one more series. Um, Indians. So, uh, yeah. so they've got a four game set against the Indians, then three against the Cubs. And that wraps up their, their season. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know this, this, this playoff format is going to be a weird one. Um, you know, with, with everything going on, but, uh, I, I just, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a, tough to go against the White Sox. You know, this team, this team in typically when you have the playoffs, there's a lot of small ball. You don't see a lot of runs scored because you're, you're short, you're shortening up the rotation and you're front loading your, your top guys. Um, and you know, with, with the playoff atmosphere, usually everybody all, you know, 
you don't score a lot of runs typically. And this White Sox team, man, I I just don't see them as as sinking in the moment. Um, I, I just see them as as a team that that rises up there and and just shows no fear and 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 just keeps hammering the baseball just like they've you know nonstop been doing. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. I feel the same way. I think they can they can really make a run here. I mean, Tim Anderson. Tim Anderson is is probably the best leadoff hitter in baseball, um, and he's a guy. Uh, you know, you look at him against Bauer, and not only not only did he he pop, you know, a couple off Bauer, is then he taunted him, and I'm like, I love that. I don't know if you you heard that, but he, you know, Bauer's got that YouTube channel. And he just, he yelled out to him. He's like, put that on your YouTube channel. And I'm like, I love that. I love that attitude. And, you know, he's basically just, it's not, we're not just happy to be here that we're, we're coming here and, you know, we're the bullies. We're going to knock you off the block. And I, I love that. I love that attitude. T- you know, Tim Anderson is a guy that I was, I was lukewarm on when he brought him up and he has just absolutely eviscerated all of my expectations and and I love the guy. I love his attitude. I love, I love what he brings to this team. Yeah. You know, talking about his expectations, he's definitely surpassed the ones I had for him in the past year or so. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, and this team finally got, uh, Mazzara to (laughs) home run this season. He's got his one, Hey! Hey! Oh! Um, you know, it was that yesterday. Uh, Encarnacion, who's been pretty much abysmal as a as a hitter, hit his tenth home run already this season. Yeah. Hey, at least he's hitting him out of the park. If you're going to hit him, hit him out of the park. Yeah. So, I mean, the guy's got a 164 batting average with ten home runs in in like 50 games. <laughs> I just, uh, I, I mean, 53 games, uh, that would be like, that would be, um, like hitting 31 home runs in a, in a regular season. So batting 164 with 31, 31 home runs, that's some Rob Deere numbers and (laughs) <laughs> some Adam Dunn numbers. Dave Kingman, you, you name or uh, Joey Gallo. Though, that's Pete Incaviglia. <laughs> like those, those are some you know, hilarious numbers. Like you're like, how how do you only hit home runs? It's like everyone is a home run. Hey, hey, it's better to be only hitting home runs, I guess, than not. Yeah, um, but you know th- this 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 lineup, man, I, I just, it's, it, it's unreal. And in between Abreu and, and Anderson, you have like two absolutely legit MVP candidates. Yep. Uh, I mean, I just, I just love the construction and it just, it just screams to the, the North side. You need a leadoff hitter. A little more than that, too. True, true. But I, I mean, Tim Anderson has been the cog that that makes this team go, and as he goes, this team goes, and he is he has gone, and I, I just I just love it. Um, you know, the 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 downfalls of this White Sox team are are some of the young pitching. Uh, you know, you you get uneven performances. Like Dylan sees today didn't look so good, um, but you know the the beauty of it is once you get into the postseason is you you shorten up those rotations. Mm-hmm. Um, you know between Giolito and and Keuchel, you expect good things. Uh, you know, so it, it's then riding the hot hand on on the other two rotation spots, and then 
as you progress further, you're like, you know, Giolito's a young guy. Dallas Keuchel is a guy that that wants to pitch more often. Is you know, you can short rest those two guys. Um, you know, I, I just I just love what they're doing here. Uh, they built they built it right. That's what I'll, I'll say. They built it right. They built they built a team with bopping bats and power arms, and uh, you know they've and they're still building it up. And that's the thing. I mean, they're going to be set up for success for a long time. And you can start off this run by making a deep run this year. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's the plan. And anything can happen in the major league baseball uh, postseason. It is it is such a a crapshoot. Um, but man, this team, this team could really make some noise. Yeah, I agree. Um, just looking back here is, you know, you, you brought Reynaldo Lopez back this week. Um, had, had, I mean, not a terrible start for him. Went five and a third, three, three earned runs, four hits, um, you know, against the twins who, but you gave up, you gave up three home runs. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's a guy I just, I wanted to really like Reynaldo Lopez and we saw, we've seen flashes from Reynaldo Lopez and I think we both sung some praises, but I, I think, I think you've squeezed everything you can squeeze out of that guy and he's just placeholding until, until the future. I agree. Uh, I agree. You know, and then the White Sox, the White Sox, that's kind of what they've done this year. It, yeah, you know, G- Giolito, your top two, you locked in. And then after that, you've relied on, on placeholders and guys that I think have stepped up maybe, maybe a season too early to, to get the job done and, and you've, you've gotten it done. Uh, you know, sometimes it's been guys, guys having good pitching performances or, or, you know, mediocre pitching performances, but those bats have really, really kept you in these games and gotten you the wins. Cause you can get to the bullpen. Right. And the bullpen is actually, you know, the White Sox bullpen is looking good and, I overall, I'd say. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, what you're doing is, is, is great. And, uh, I just, you know, I, I'm excited. I'm excited for the playoffs. I mean, you're locked in, but it would be nice. It would be nice if they could win this division. And, uh, it makes it easier on you. Uh, you know, it's, the Cubs aren't doing you any favors. Um, but, you know, you and you got two tough series against the Indians and the Cubs. And if the Cub, if the White Sox win this division, which I, I, th- I mean, I think they're poised to, it's, it's going to be, they went out and earned it. You know, there's no gim- gimmies here. Yeah, no, they would have 100% earned it. When you have two teams that are, competing right there with you in the Indians and the twins, if they do win the division, they 100% earned it. Yeah. I mean, so the Cubs, the Cubs are about to lose today. Um, and that'll put, that'll put the twins two behind the white Sox, And with seven games left, um, I mean, I think, I think the white Sox can wrap it up. Um, I, I'd be shocked if they don't win the series against the Cubs and at least split against the against the Indians. Right. And the Twins have the Tigers and the Reds. And that Reds series is not going to be an easy one. No. Um, it's and, a, and, the, and the Twins have also kind of struggled against the lower division teams. Uh, you know, because the, the the Reds are the Reds are playing for it. That you know they they're, and right they're hot back right in, now. Yeah, they're they're eight and two in their last ten. Um, and they're they're right in the thick of things. So if the stand as the standings are right now, Cubs 
Cubs are in first place. Cardinals are in second, four back. Brewers are five back and tied with the the Reds, five back. So I mean the the Reds are are fighting here for for a playoff spot and, and I think I think they're significantly better than the Brewers. Um, On paper, absolutely. I mean, better rotation, better uh, batting order, definitely. Uh, it's going to be. Do they catch up to the the Cardinals? Um, who the Cardinals? I'm trying to see who plays who at the end of the season. So the the Reds have the Brewers and the Twins. Watch the Cardinals are going to have like seven games against the Pirates or something. I, they can, but <laughs> they're going to have. It's probably going to be. Card- well, they did just play the Pirates. It's going to be. Uh, yeah. Look, the Roy- the Royals and the Brewers. So they got a three game set against the Royals. Of course they do. Of course. It's like it's like the universe is like, hey, th- th- let's let's give the Cardinals, uh, you know, every advantage we can. You just do the Cardinals. Um, you know, I honestly with the Cubs, I I was looking at. At the before today, I was looking at it. It's like, all right, the Cubs got you Darvish pitching today, and then they have a four game set against the Pirates. They should lock up this division, you know, right? And then the Cubs can't score any damn runs, any runs, and you you spoil you Darvish. (sighs) <sighs> Sean, the amount of conflicting feelings I have for this Cubs team are unbelievable. They're in first place by quite a bit. They're going to be going to the playoffs. They started 13-3. and You Darvish has been a Cy Young candidate. I don't think he'll win the Cy Young, but he's been a Cy Young candidate. David Ross has shown a number of good things. But... There is no consistency with this team. The lineup can look so unbelievably terrible. The bullpen has had so many rough points. Granted, the bullpen has been overall better lately. Not fantastic, I wouldn't say, but better than when they started. But, man, I just... They had that five-game win streak. They had a magical win against the Brewers with the go-ahead home run from Jason Hayward off Hayter. Then they had the Alec Mills no-hitter. Then you swept the Indians. Two walk-off wins, two close games, but you know what? It's two good teams going at each other. You were able to win both. And then you squeaked out one nothing win against the Twins. You couldn't do anything against Rich Hill, but the one run you got was enough. And now these last last two nights, they look like duty again. And you just, you see them go through stretches just like you've seen the past few nights. And Schwarber was benched in the middle of the game tonight. Not for an injury reason. He was just benched. And he has been terrible lately. And Chris Bryant is just floating around the Mendoza line. He had the tying run in scoring position. When we were talking about the Bears game, he struck out. He has five RBIs all year. Baez has been at least not overall good, but he's had some big hits and big moments. Anthony Rizzo has really struggled. You take away Ian Happ and Jason Hayward, what the hell have you had consistent lineup-wise? Here's your answer. Nothing. Fucking nothing. What what would be the bare minimum OPS that you would expect from the middle of your, you know, your your two, three, four, five hitters. I'd say about eight, 10 minimum. You know what you have? What? Rizzo seven twenty one. That's league average. Schwarber six ninety nine. Below league average. Contreras seven fifty six. Decent, Pr- solid, solid. Baez six oh nine. Terrible. Bryant five eighty four disgustingly embarrassingly terrible that that is your the heart of your order uh i mean kipnis kipnis has been is is 808 and 
other than Hayward, 910 and Hap, 906, you are just absolutely abysmal. Like this, this team is limping to the playoffs and I see, I see no way they make any noise in the playoffs. I just, I really don't. Their team OPS going in tonight. Do you know what it is? Their team OPS. Take I'm, a guess. 620. They're not that bad. That's <laughs> that's the Pirates, dude. <laughs> I don't know. What is it? So, you know how I told you that league average, according to Fangraphs, is 720? Yeah. It's 716. That's Oof. 20th in baseball. <sighs> Let's expand this further, shall we? Shall we? Shall we? Shall we? Okay. Average. This is batting average. Again, batting average can be a little overrated, but just for the fuck of it, they're 27th. In average. 27th. 27th. Now let's look at on base percentage. 17. They're saving grace. They can draw walks. I'll give them that. Now. WRC plus. And for those of you. Though, those of you who don't really know about it. It's um, runs created plus. It's basically a value of, you know, creating runs, so to speak. And the best team in baseball right now, surprisingly the Mets, at 124. And right behind them is the Atlanta Braves at 121. And then uh, the Yankees at 120. So there's your top three. They're in the 120s at WRC+. The Cubs are 93. That's 21st. Yeah, I mean... Compared to the White Sox, who uh, I I'm gonna I'm gonna th- guess numbers here for the White Sox. Okay. Um. Batting average as a team. Hmm. Two seventy. Two sixty nine. So close. Um. On base, this one's going to be a tricky one because they they don't walk a ton. So it's not. I'm going to go 325. 332. Slugging. I think. I think they're going to be way up there. I'm going to say 470. 475. 469. And so that would put OPS right right around 800. Right at it. So that that probably puts them top five. Yeah. For all those categories or roughly. Yeah, you pretty much. I mean, they're right there with like the Dodgers, the Yankees and the Padres. They're right in that four to six mix um, of most of those categories. Uh, I mean, they're tied with the Padres, WRC plus 119. They're just one tick behind the Dodgers and the Yankees. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if if the Cubs had their pitching, starting pitching rolling like it did in when they started 13 and 3, you're like, okay, you know, maybe they can manufacture a couple of runs here and there. Mm-hmm. And although they're not getting a ton of hits, if they're timely enough, they can, win. but the pitching, the pitching hasn't been like that. Is John Lester has, although better than when he just was eviscerated, um, you know, hasn't been necessarily that good this year at all. Uh, Darvish has been great. Hendricks has been pretty good. Um, and then after that, question mark. Yeah, so if you look at um, fielding independent pitching, which is basically a quote-unquote more accurate ERA, it takes in factors, you know, like hits, home runs, walks, all that good stuff, not just earned, unearned runs. Um, Yu Darvish is at a 217 FIP going into tonight. Again, uh, tonight's stats against the Twins don't count uh, for those playing. 217. And Kyle Hendricks is 327. Both very, very good. 
very, very, very good. Um, John Lester's FIP is 517. That is no bueno. But that's just him being old. And he was, he's able to at least grind enough where at least his last few starts, he's kept them in the game. He had a really good start against the Brewers um, last week, so I'll give him that. And then, you know, Tyler Chatwood, who got off to a good start, he has a 335 FIP on the year. He's been hurt for how many weeks? And Jose Quintana, who actually looked like he was going to be pretty good, he's he's hurt again. So, yeah. It's tough. Alec Mills is a guy that just threw a no-hitter, but then he also pooped the bed. Um, was his next start? Yeah, I mean, he wasn't god awful, but he wasn't good. It was a meh start. It was a meh start. Yeah, it was like a meh minus. <laughs> it was like it was like when you throw up in your mouth, but it only gets up to like your tongue and it doesn't actually come out. So you can taste the upchuck, but it doesn't actually come out. I'm it doesn't very... come out. It doesn't come out where you're all embarrassed, but it makes everything you're trying to eat later taste gross. <laughs> I'm sorry I even brought this up. It's not like he's a Bills fan. Uh, ew. Ew. <laughs> that's, the, that's the Pirates. They're a Bills fan puke. Oh, that team is so bad. But it's just, it's, you know, like we, we talk about about the, the White Sox where, you know, the front end of their, their rotation we're pretty confident with. But then after that, yeah, you know, it's been a, it's been a lot of young guys who have come up big at moments and had shrunk down at moments, and some in, a lot of inconsistency. And honestly, that's what we're getting with the Cubs too. Is the front end of the rotation very good? And then after that, it's it's a crapshoot, crapshoot what you're mm-hmm. going to get. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You feel good about the first two guys, and then after that, it's yeah. I mean, if you know, if you throw John Lester out there, what which John Lester are you getting? You want to hope that playoff John Lester is just automatically activated, but at this point of his career, you don't know if that's going to happen. I mean, honestly, if you're if you go into the playoffs, um, like, aren't you aren't you excited to see John Lester at this point? I mean, in very normal stances, uh, circumstances through most of his career, you're thrilled to see him at this point. I'm not so sure. I mean, not not if you're a Cubs fan. If you're the opposing hitter, uh, you know, you've... Oh, is it opposed? Oh, yeah, I see. I, I mean, I see. If, if you're a batter, I mean, as far as you look at, you look at the pitching matchups and as a batter in the playoffs, man... It's tough because every night you're facing an ace, 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 ace. You're probably thrilled to death to see 2020 John Lester out there going, all right, here's a guy I can actually hit the ball against. What were you, Tom Ricketts playing? (laughs) Hey, guys, I can hit off this guy. I can get a hit off this guy. (laughs) I practiced by hitting pumpkins at Gallagher Way. Ugh. But, you know, it's just overall, Sean, it just I look at the Cubs. I'm like, it. I feel like they're, they're kind of pulling the season out of their ass. And there have been some stretches where the Cubs have legit looked like a good team because, you know, they have a lot of good players on paper. But you know that there's flaws and several of your most important players are having really, really down years. It's amazing that they're at where they're at when you look at. Just look, don't compare the team overall to other teams. Just bring up the Cubs lineup and look at their latest stats. You're looking up and down. You're saying, how the heck are they ahead by like four games or whatever in the division this late with this team? You know, I mean, again, it's 60 game season. I know the sample size is different, but I just, man, there's so many frustrating things about this team and it's, it's, Sometimes I feel bad complaining right now because they just had that nice five-game win streak, but 
I mean, how many streaks of the season have they just, there's just no consistency and it's maddening. You just, you know that on paper they should be better. Even though on paper you see that there are flaws no matter what, even if the core was playing at their top level, you know there are flaws with this team. But with the flaws, you have a lot of your core players not playing well, and yet you have already have over 30 wins. It's just, it's weird. It's weird, man. And my expectations are not high. I think that obviously there is room for them to make a run. Just they've they've at least earned the right with what they've accomplished in years past to say that there is a path for them to make a run. But if you're going on what's happening now, you still don't put that very high. But there will always be that chance that exists because they did earn that chance. I'm looking at what the if the playoffs were to start today, what the matchups would be. And do you know who the Cubs and the White Sox would be playing if the playoffs started today? Would they be would the Cubs be playing the Cardinals? They would be playing the Phillies. Phillies. Oh, okay. And the White Sox will be playing the Indians. Well, you'd have a nice division matchup right there with the Cubs. You know, they haven't seen the Phillies this year. And the last time we saw the Phillies, Bryce Harper hit one to Mars. Yeah. Um, Though I actually think the Cubs could beat the Phillies. I think they can. I think they could. The Phillies are another team that has just been disappointing. Um, but then I look at the rest of the... the so right now for the NL, the matchups would be Dodgers versus Reds, Cubs versus Phillies, Braves versus Cardinals, Padres versus Marlins. Hey, keep an eye on those Padres, too. I want no part of the Dodgers, Braves, or Padres. Could you imagine that Braves team? I mean, if you want to talk about right now, like, the scariest offense in the league, have you seen what the Braves have done? They're just, they clobber the baseball. Oh, man. Ozzie Albies and... Freddie Freeman and um, Acuna Jr., man, they've got some mashers, man. I'd say that they're the best lineup in the NL. Um, I mean, that, that's my pick. That's my pick for the World Series for the, the NL. Braves? Yeah. I could see it. Um, the American League, the way it would shape up right now is the Rays versus the Blue Jays, the White mm-hmm. Sox versus the Indians, the Athletics versus the Astros, and the Yankees versus the Twins. Of course the Twins would play the Yankees. Why wouldn't they? And the funny part is, is like, the Twins, the Twins probably should match up well against the Yankees, and they're gonna, they're going to shrink. That's what the Twins do, is the Yankees, the Yankees rise up to the occasion, and the Twins shrink. I remember... Tiny. I remember last year uh, watching the playoffs between the Twins and the Yankees, and I posted Millhouse going, I was watching. First it started falling over, then it fell over. <laughs> I remember sitting at a brewery watching those games and just going, what? how, how, why, why can't this team come rise to the occasion? And I, you know, I don't care anything about the Twins. I just really hate the Yankees. Well, you know what? I, do you remember 2009 when the Yankees won their last World Series? The first round was against that Twins team that came from behind and overtook Detroit in 163. And you're thinking, man, could this Twins team ride that momentum into the postseason? And then, of course, the Yankees swept them in the first round. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's just how it goes. Um. I mean, so then would the White Sox play Yankees then after that, after they beat the Indians? That's going to be an awesome matchup to watch the White Sox kick the ever-loving shit out of the Yankees. Now, don't jinx anything. I, I'm just, I'm not jinxing. I'm just stating a fact. The White Sox will kick the shit out of the Yankees. Remember when you said we were going to the Super Bowl a few years ago? When they beat the Eagles, 
Remember when I said the White Sox would make the playoffs and guaranteed it? I guaranteed it. Did you? I did. Really? I, I don't did. remember that. I don't gonna, remember. I could. I will pull the tape because I got, as my buddy Gary just like yelled at me about it. <laughs> oh, okay. You know what? I think I do remember that now. <laughs> it told me to shut up. And I, the, the White Sox, the Rays might be a tough matchup. The Athletics might be tough, but they will beat the crap out of the Yankees. Mm. <laughs> but the Cubs might beat the Phillies. But then after that, they're not beating the Padres. They're not beating the Braves. They're not beating the Dodgers. Unless baseball craziness happens, I, I wouldn't like their chances as much either. And it's where I, I never thought I would rip a first place Cubs team like I have. It's just, I just, uh, I truly believe they have a better record than how they've played. You know, they've, they've played okay. It's just, they're just getting by. Basically. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's when you look, all right. So. The, the Cubs and the White Sox have a very similar record. Mm -hmm. But when you look and, and you project out based on, on the numbers that they've put up, the way they've played, um, it's the White Sox project so much better. And Yeah, and they do. You see the path for them to win. You yes. see what it is. And it's it's on the backs of, of those huge bats. And sure... You know, bats can just go silent, but this team has just been, it's just, they, they've been absolute maulers at the plate. There has been no slowdown. Uh, you know, you've seen the Cubs go long stretches without scoring runs. You haven't really seen that with the White Sox. Sure, there's been a game here and there where they, they can't score runs, but for the most part, they just, those games are few and far between and they don't they don't stack them up. Yeah, the offense has been more consistent for them. There's no question about that. The Cubs, the Cubs, you can go and look, you know, double digit innings in a row without scoring any runs. Yeah. Multiple it's, times. It's frustrating. Yeah. It's so when they're winning games, they're, you know, like, and it, with the Cubs, when they're losing games, they are losing games. Like they don't, they don't lose a game. That's a, a tight one. They lose, they lose bad. And you're watching today. What should have been probably a real close game is I don't have it on. I have the football game on, but I'm four, nothing. It's four, nothing in the top of the ninth and they have scratched out four hits. So yeah, there you go. Um, and, uh, Let's see. What's today? The 20th. So yesterday, blown out. Blown out. That was a tie game going into the sixth inning, and they got blown out 8-1. to one. Yeah, I'm glad I was uh, at my block party and not watching that poop. You know, the, the Friday game, I listened to that one on the radio, and, and it was like so nerve-wracking. Because they were, you knew if the Cubs gave up any runs, they were losing that game. I was listening to one on the radio, too. I was out for a long walk that night and had it on my little Walkman. That's funny. Um, I was I was driving, so I was in my car. And I was just like, and, and you know, Jeremy Jeffress did everything he could to blow that game. Yeah, and, thank God he got out of that. And, and, but you just, you just felt it. You're like, all right, the Cubs scored, the Cubs scored one run in the first inning and then goose egg, goose egg, goose egg, goose egg, goose egg. Uh, and, and then, you know, I talked about stacking it is that stacked into, they scored one run the next game. And then I talked about stacking that carried over into nine innings today. Wouldn't it be funny if uh, we signed off our show and then we edited it? Well, you edited it. I can never say that right. And 
as soon as we're done recording, the Cubs score five in the bottom of the ninth. I, I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. <laughs> Ye of little faith. Yeah, I, me of little faith. I, That's okay. I'm not holding my breath either. But they have they have stacked up, you know, three games in a row where they've scored, uh, you know, one run. So they have two runs in in 27 innings. Yeah, I mean they're they're in danger of going three games with just two runs if they don't score any in the bo- uh, the bottom of the ninth. You know what will happen? Just to be hilarious, they'll score three runs and lose four to three. It's it's. I watch this. I watch this Cubs team play a good team like the Twins, and I just picture uh, Ralph Wiggum sitting on the bus by himself, going. I'm in danger. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's it's just it's just tough, and you 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 don't know how they manufacture any runs. Um, it is it is boom or bust for this team, and it's been a lot of bust, an absolute lot of bust. And yet they'll make the playoffs for the fifth time in six years. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I- I'm just going to start here with Friday's game. Rizzo, no hits. Bryant, no hits. Uh, uh, Baez, no hits. Hayward, no hits. Kipnis, no hits. Horner, no hits. Um, and then you follow it up with yesterday's game. And Hap, no hits. Bryant, no hits. Rizzo, no hits. Contreras, no hits. Schwarber, no hits. Horner, no hits. Schwarber has been so bad lately. So bad. Yep. And today, Hap, no hits. Schwarber, no hits. And benched. Yeah. Hayward, no hits. Baez, no hits. Like That's, that's a lot of big goose eggs. That's poop is what it is. <laughs> Hey everybody! <laughs> uh, I just, I just, I'm, I don't, I'm not ready for the playoffs because I just, the season has already been just, it, it came and went. It was so. I short. know, I know, yeah. And, um, you know, normally sixty games, we're not even halfway through the season, and now here we are with. You know the season is is almost over, and you know, sure, it's a good record, but it is smoke and mirrors. Yeah, you had a you had a few good stretches and a lot of smoke and mirrors. Um, and smoke and mirrors don't work in in Major League Baseball postseason, unless you're the Cardinals. That's well, that's not smoke and mirrors. That's voodoo magic. Yeah, right. Like they they sacrifice a virgin, and and make all kinds of weird spells, and I don't know what they do, but um, but like major they, league, they sacrifice a whole chicken. Is Joe Boo? They pour Joe Boo his rum. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of getting the chicken, they just get the KFC. <laughs> we should have gotten uh, a live chicken. I love that line from Willie Mays Hayes. Should have gotten a live chicken. <laughs> Oh, Major League. I might watch that tonight. It's so good. One of my favorites, if not my favorite baseball movie. <sighs> One of these days we should go through and talk baseball movies. Yes. Yes. Let's do it. Let's make top 10 best, top 10 worst. Yes. I Let's do that for, let's give ourselves two weeks. Okay. And top 10 best, top 10 worst of baseball movies. And uh, that should be awesome because I love baseball movies. Me too. And yeah, I need a few weeks to kind of compose my list. So yeah. Yeah. I might have to rewatch a couple. There you go. There's probably a bunch that I haven't seen and and I've skewed, skewed memory of them. Exactly. There you go. So yeah, we'll give us some time to do that and then we'll compose our ultimate list. There's one more thing I want to talk about. Hmm. And that is Dan McNeil. 
Oh, yeah, I heard about that. Because you texted me about it. Yeah, so Dan McNeil, so uh, he made a, a lewd comment about a female sideline reporter in the NFL. And it, it would be bad enough if he didn't have a track record of just being an asshole and a misogynist. And you know what? They're paying him a lot of money. They pay him over a million dollars a year on the score. He gets that much? Mm-hmm. He gets what? paid. Yeah, it's one million twenty-five thousand dollars, and then he gets a twenty-five thousand dollar raise every February. And I think he had another. I think it was signed for another year. So like from February of next twenty-one till February twenty-two. I think that's how long the contract was. I had no idea he made that much. Yeah. So, uh, the guy makes a ton of money, and Danny Parkins carries that show. Um, and so you're going to have a guy who's creating an issue, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of respected female reporters and broadcasters in Chicago, uh, stepped up and said they had bad experiences with Dan McNeil as well. And he had to go and he got fired he didn't say anything until 6.18 this morning. Mm. And he finally broke his silence and said, sorry. And it was a half-assed apology where at the end he put a, he basically put LOL, going fishing. Boy. Uh, so, yeah. ad- adios, Dan McNeil. Um, he was washed up a while ago, honestly. You know, how many how many chances does this guy have? Like, this guy has burned through his nine lives. This, no, there's no more, no more, uh, you know, chances for this guy. He's done. Yeah, and I, he's he's made all that money, so he probably doesn't even need to do anything at this point. But yeah, I, th- please don't bring him back they they did that once and that was enough and just let it no more i'm just shocked that dan bernstein didn't didn't get dinged too because he made a comment about the same reporter except he talked about her boobs and wasn't that a while ago or was that recently um i don't know when it was from but he made a comment about her boobs so i'm like whoa like what is going on why like Dan Dan McNeil is is a is a dumb dumb. Like Dan Bernstein likes to hang his hat that he's an intellectual, and then to make these boneheaded comments. Yeah. Like, like I just get with the program, man. Yeah. Yep. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I think I said my piece. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for listening. Uh, please hit subscribe however you listen to podcasts, whether that's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, TuneIn app, Google Play, Spotify. Uh, share this podcast with your friends. That's how we grow the show. Uh, follow us on social media at Swirsky Sports, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, Swirsky Sports.com. Again, thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. We thank Dick uh, and God for all they have provided. Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win. Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31 to negative 7. Da, da, Bears! Oh, when the bears go bearing down, I wanna...